2125. I've been thinking about that year a lot lately. It's got special significance for me because that's the year when I will undergo what I've come to call anyway my second death or the death of memory. I don't know if there's a real term out there for it or not. That's just what I've been calling it. But what that basically means is we're all going to die. We know this. It's inevitable. It's unfortunate. But someday in the future, long after that, somebody else is going to die. And that person will be the last person who ever had any actual memory of you. After this point, there'll be no memory that you ever existed. I mean, sure, there'll be photos and videos and now a whole social media footprint that no one will care about because nobody knows who you were. By the way, I got to the number 2125 by applying an average 80-year life expectancy to myself. And then I was asking myself, how old would a person need to be to really remember me like for the rest of their lives. And I don't know what that number might be, but I came up with 10 because it's an easy round number. So then I applied an 80 year life expectancy to that person, subtract the 10 that they knew me, and that's how I got 2125. Now this estimate may be way off. There's a lot of variables involved. I might live way longer than that. I might get hit by a bus tomorrow. But life expectancy has been increasing for decades and health technologies are increasing at an incredible rate, so much so that many believe that not only would that other person still be alive in 2125, but so could I. Roddy Kowalski, Jonathan Reiser, and Ash Kurden asked, can you do a video on life extension? When people talk about life extension, they generally fall into two camps, the immortalists and the health spanners. Immortalists like Ray Kurzweil eventually want to merge humans with technology, to embrace transhumanism, to upload our consciousnesses into avatars and virtual simulated worlds. Hell spanners aren't all that interested in becoming cyborgs, they're more interested in just prolonging human life by finding a cure for aging. They see aging as a disease, just like any other disease. And for them it's not so much about living forever as it is about living well for as long as possible. Now I've already covered a lot of the immortalist ideas in other videos, I'll share those in a playlist you can watch right here. So for today I'm going to focus on the health spanners and some of the technologies they're working on that you might be able to take advantage of yourself in the next couple of decades. Now a lot of times people kind of bristle at the idea of living to be 100 years old because they imagine the last 20 years of their lives are going to be consumed with a plague of different age-related diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia and cancer and heart disease. We see the image of being imprisoned in a, in a home somewhere, barely able to get out of bed, never seeing the outside world, just talking to ourselves out of sheer loneliness with only dogs to keep us company. Oh my God, that's my life right now. But what if you were as active at 90 as you were at 40? What if you were traveling the world at 100 years old? What if you were playing softball with your great, great grandkids at 120? What if age really was nothing but a number? You know, the argument that I always hear whenever people talk about immortality, living forever, or just radical life extension in general is that people feel like they would get bored with life after a while. And to them, I say, are you freaking kidding me? At our current level of knowledge, it would take 10 lifetimes to know everything there is to know and experience everything there is to experience. Hundreds of different cultures and languages out there to learn about. Seven billion people with seven billion unique perspectives and life stories to discover. Not to even mention the advances that are coming down the pike in space travel and traveling around the cosmos and, and virtual worlds that we can't even imagine right now. And you're afraid you're going to be bored? I'm sorry, but if you're bored with life, that's your problem. And guess what? You don't have to do the life extension stuff. You can check out whenever you want. I mean, seriously, are you gonna argue that you want Alzheimer's? That you want cancer, dementia, arthritis? There's no legitimate argument against this. What about the fact that we'd run out of resources if nobody died? Except for that. Okay, there are some downsides that we should talk about, although the overpopulation one I think is a little bit overblown because just because we've cured aging-related diseases doesn't mean nobody's gonna die. People, millions of people die of accidents every single year, and probability states that eventually that's gonna catch up to you. And birth rates have been dropping for decades and will continue to do so as quality of life increases, especially in the developing world, so it probably isn't gonna be as bad as we think it is. Besides, not everybody will take the life extension treatment, and let's just be honest, not everybody will be able to afford it. Which is another downside. Our society is already stratified too much as it is. Radical life extension that only wealthy people can afford would just make it worse. There's also the argument that in a world where people are working way past 100 or even 150 years old would make it really hard for younger people to get into the job market. As if that wasn't bad enough already. 
So there are some things to work out, but just think about what the most brilliant people in the world could do with an unlimited lifespan. How many more discoveries could Einstein have made? How many more masterpieces could Shakespeare have written? How many more insults could Don Rickles have thrown? Plus, think about how badass retirement accounts could be. You could set up a modest index fund account in your mid-twenties and retire a multi-millionaire at 150 years old. Now, this is all pie-in-the-sky stuff that could be possible if we cured aging, but here's the thing. It's still a big if. Believe it or not, there's still not a clear, widely accepted explanation for why we age. And it's an incredibly hard problem to solve because it occurs at different rates and different scales across different functions of our body. For example, the heart ages at a different rate than the brain. Also, the foundational causes of aging go all the way down into the cellular and even molecular levels. So we're talking about repairing and replacing whole organs while simultaneously switching on and off proteins and enzymes at the genetic level. Now we've known for a while now that aging is tied into metabolism in some way because when you look at the animal kingdom, the animals that have the highest metabolisms have the shortest lifespans and vice versa. So that leads us into our first kind of life extension technique, caloric restriction. Caloric restriction or dietary restriction is a regimen where people eat at least 30% fewer calories than normal and then supplement with vitamin supplements to make sure they get all the nutrition that they need. But they believe that this works by putting your body into a fasting state. The theory is that when your body's in a fasting state, it focuses its energy on tissue repair, so you get less tissue damage and a longer lifespan. Experiments with caloric restriction in mice showed an up to 45% longer lifespan, and they found similar results in experiments with rhesus monkeys. This, of course, begs the question, is a longer life worth living if you're only eating like a POW the entire time? For many people, the answer is no. But studies have started showing similar results from intermittent fasting. Now there are different types of intermittent fasting. One of them involves not really eating anything until the late afternoon, so you're kind of fasting throughout a big part of your day. Uh, the actor Terry Crews actually is a big proponent of this. Now this has some noted benefits, but the type of fasting that we're gonna talk about is the kind where you actually go about five days out of every month without eating. This <laughs> does not sound fun, but it is only one week a month. <laughs> it's only one week a month. But studies tend to show that this puts your body into extreme tissue repair and can even help prevent cancer. So the cancer thing is actually pretty interesting because the theory goes that when you fast for that long, your body goes into ketosis. Ketosis is when the body pulls energy out of your fat cells. Your cells get energy from a substance called ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and normally it gets ATP by converting glucose into ATP, glucose coming from the food that you eat. But energy that's stored in your fat cells is not in the form of glucose, it's in the form of ketones. So your cells are able to convert ketones into ATP to get energy that way, but there's a certain type of cell that can't do that. Cancer cells. So the theory is that if you intermittent fast from time to time, five days at a time, it's long enough to starve out those cancer cells that you might have in your body before they can form tumors. Now this is really cool, but it's also an oversimplification. There are hundreds of different types of cancers out there. Some of them respond differently to this, and it's also a really extreme thing to do to your body. So if you want to do something like this, definitely talk to a doctor first. So the first strategy is don't eat. The second strategy, don't breathe. One of the things that causes the most metabolic wear and tear on your cells is oxidative stress. Life on this planet has a really weird relationship with oxygen. Do you realize that for the first half of the history of planet Earth, all life was single-celled? And this single-celled life got their energy without oxygen, something called anaerobic metabolism. Life was stuck at this stage for over two billion years before it figured out oxidation, which incorporates oxygen into the production of ATP, which is a much more efficient form of energy production. Like, insanely more efficient. It's like the difference between a match and an acetylene torch. Aerobic life reproduced faster, spread further, and had enough excess energy to become multicellular. Now this is a very, very big deal. When we talk about the great filters life has to go through to gain intelligence, the first one, becoming multicellular, might be the biggest. It might be exceedingly rare. And oxidative energy is the process that makes that possible. But this acetylene torch burns hot and fast and eventually wears down the cell by bombarding it with free radicals, which are ions, basically atoms with unpaired electrons that can do damage to other molecules in the cells, including DNA. So the very element that makes our lives possible is the element that ensures our death. Oxygen. Can't live with it, can't live without it. Luckily, there are antioxidants, which bind to these free radicals and prevents them from damaging the cell. Just in case you ever wondered what all the antioxidant buzz was all about. Now, antioxidant supplementation has shown to reduce the risk of some age-related diseases, but it doesn't really do much about the aging process. It doesn't really increase lifespan. So, good stuff, but 
not the droids we're looking for. Now a lot of research in the last couple of decades has focused on telomeres. So imagine that this shoelace is a chromosome. And this aglet at the end that holds the shoelace together, and yeah, these are called aglets. No idea how I know that. These would be the telomeres, and they serve the same function. They keep the chromosome from unwinding and unraveling at the ends. Well, scientists discovered that these telomeres, these chromosomal aglets, actually get a little bit shorter every time your cell reproduces, which means over time they get shorter and shorter to the point that they stop to function and your DNA, your chromosomes, start to get frayed and unravel a little bit. These lead to the cells becoming damaged enough to stop reproducing, which is also known as the Hayflick limit. But they also discovered an enzyme that's created in cells that reproduce really often, like skin cells and stem cells, called telomerase, that actually lengthens and prevents the shortening of these telomeres, meaning the cells and tissues last much longer before they hit the Hayflick limit. This was a big deal, and actually won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for physiology or medicine. So there are now a whole slew of books and studies on how we can increase our telomere production in our cells. And one particular product called TA65 is showing a lot of promise in doing that. And there are some studies and information about that down in the description below. But the drug that's really got everybody talking these days is metformin. Metformin is a drug that's been prescribed since the 1950s for diabetes, so it's nothing new. But over the decades, researchers started to notice some things. Patients who took metformin were living longer and having fewer aging-related diseases. And one study actually found that they were not only living longer than diabetic patients who were not taking metformin, they were living longer than non-diabetic people as well. Interestingly, it's a derivative of a plant called goat's rue, which was used in the medieval times for frequent urination, which is a symptom of diabetes. So what metformin does is it tells your pancreas to make less insulin by disrupting the oxidative process. And remember what I was saying earlier about calorie-restricted diets? giving a signal to cells to go into a starvation mode, well the signal that your body gives to those cells it comes in the form of insulin. Now obviously this is helpful for diabetics, but it also sort of mimics the calorie restriction diet without having to eat like a POW. Even the cancer fighting aspects. Some of the great things about metformin is that it's cheap. It only costs five cents to make, and it's been around so long that nobody owns a patent on it anymore, which means anybody can make it. But that's also a downside because there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. That research costs money, and people don't really invest in things when there's no way for them to make a lot of money on that investment. And there needs to be very extensive research done, because what they're trying to do is get the FDA to approve metformin as an anti-aging pill. And that's something they've never done before. Up until only recently, age-related research was considered almost on the fringe of medical science. Aging was considered something that was inevitable, that you couldn't treat, that it was a foregone conclusion, you couldn't do anything about it. So the medicines and the regulations around them focused on treating age-related conditions, but not aging itself. If the FDA approves metformin, they are basically saying that aging is a disease. A disease that can be treated. This is a massive shift in perception. This would take aging research out of the fringe and into the mainstream. And should metformin get passed and approved, insurance companies probably would line up to uh, cover it because it's cheap for one thing and it prevents really expensive diseases that they would have to pay for. People living to be 120 years old might be commonplace. So that would push my date of second death to 2205. Good show, old chap. Now that's pretty good, but it's still more of a treatment for aging-related diseases. It's still not increasing lifespan, it's just increasing health span. And that's fantastic, but even as more and more people are living past 100, record numbers of people, they still tend to drop right around 120. 120 seems to be the max lifespan for a human being. We just can't seem to get past that. But there is a guy who thinks that we could beat that. His name is Rasputin. I'm sorry, Aubrey de Grey. You really can't talk about anti-aging research without mentioning Aubrey de Grey. He's the head scientist and founder of the SENS Research Foundation. He's eccentric, to say the least, but he's also a huge anti-aging advocate and makes some really compelling points. Seriously, just do a search on YouTube. He's done like a million TED Talks. The team at the SENS Research has pinpointed seven different categories of cellular damage that leads to aging, and they set about trying to fix them one at a time. And they are cell loss and tissue atrophy, cancerous cells, mitochondrial mutations, death-resistant cells, extracellular matrix stiffening, extracellular aggregates, and intracellular aggregates. And the exciting thing is that these strategies are based on technologies that already exist. This isn't some woo-woo sci-fi word salad. These are metabolic processes we currently understand and know how to fix right now. 
SENS also advocates treating the human body like a car that can be maintained by just repairing organs that have worn out over time. Luckily what science can do is they can take some of your cells and clone you and then implant that cloned embryo into a surrogate mother and when that clone is born it's given this life in this bubble where they have everything they want, they live their lives in peace and harmony until you need one of their organs and then they murder that clone and then, wait, no, that's the movie The Island. What they can do is take your regular cells and turn them into pluripotent stem cells and then those stem cells can be triggered to turn into any type of cell that you need. Those cells could then become organs that you could transplant into yourself when you need them. Some scientists are working on 3D printing organs by laying stem cells onto a lattice and then making an organ out of that. We're pretty far away from that. But there are stem cell therapies where they insert stem cells into damaged tissue where they then proliferate and become a part of that organ, basically introducing brand new young cells into the organ and revitalizing it that way. And this has shown a lot of promise. But the true life extension technology is nanobots. Swarms of cell-sized nanobots that can be programmed to go through our body and repair tissue, reconnect neurons, clean out our arteries, repair tissue damage. That is the ultimate life extension. Imagine just little army of sentinels throughout your body that can respond whenever you have a health checkup to just go fix whatever problem. Maybe you could even control it on an app. Seems pretty far-fetched, but nanobots are already a thing. A team of researchers at Durham University in England have created tiny nanobots 1 50th the size of a human hair that can be programmed to seek out and attach themselves to cancer cells. And then once that it gets blasted with some kind of light or radiation, it spins a molecular gear in that nanobot that drills down into the cancer cell and kills it. Right now they're testing these out on fish. They soon will be testing them on mice. Hopefully in a few years, they'll be tested in humans as well. Life extension technologies are kind of having a moment right now. Millions of dollars are flooding into this research from billionaires and foundations around the world who are starting to ask the question, is it really weird and unnatural to cure aging? I mean, it, it used to be natural that you would die of smallpox. It was natural to get a cut and die from an infection from that. One example of Silicon Valley's involvement in this research is Google's new anti-aging company, Calico. Now they've been extremely secretive. Nobody really knows what they're working on, but they do have $1.2 billion in the bank and Google. So maybe they're just spinning their wheels or maybe they're breaking new ground and we'll find out about it in a few years. Interesting times. Now I've made no secret of the fact that I don't want to die. But more than that, I want to be able to live without fear of dying, you know? I want to live and experience and enjoy this thing, and the longer I can do that, the better. Now this is a huge topic, there's a lot that I left out. Uh, you guys can feel free to talk about things maybe that I missed in the comments or didn't talk about in the comments. And there's also a lot of links down in the description of things that I didn't have time to talk about here. Tons of information, go check all that out and read it for yourselves. But I wanna hear how excited you are about this kind of stuff. Which one of these technologies sounds most reasonable to you? Which ones do you think hold the most promise? Which ones are you lined up for? Are you interested in it at all? Discuss downstairs. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you enjoyed this shirt and would like one of your own, you can go to answerswithjoe.com slash shirt. This is just one of dozens of really cool and fun designs that we have there. Uh, so you can check it out. You can get a cool shirt and it helps support the channel. A big special thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon who help support this channel. We have a lot of new people I want to read out really quickly. I'm going to go through as fast as I can. There's Dimitri J, D, D. Rudley or Drudley. Craig Lewis, Fleming, Shannon Jones, Johnny Golder, 10X Labs, Andre Blankrome, Jeff Harris, Jack Strang, Chris Davis, Charlie Livingston, Michael Tilly, Andrew Yoder, and Jordan Wegman, and Ewan Smith. Wow, so many new people. Thank you guys so much for joining. If you would like to join them, get access to secret perks and things that nobody else gets access to, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. And as usual, this video is supported by cankerboy.com. If you get regular mouth ulcers or canker sores, the pain, it sucks. This is a pill you can take every day, helps prevent them, it is magic. Just go to cankerboy.com, there's a two month risk-free trial. All right, like and share if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, please check out some of these other videos. There should be one right in here somewhere for you to see what else I got going on. And if you like any of those, please hit subscribe. I come back with videos just like this every Monday. All right, you guys know what I'm gonna say here. Thanks so much for watching. You guys have an eye-opening week and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.